um, welcome everybody. Um, this is um, a part of an NADT um, sponsored effort um, to allow us to sort of develop different digital tools. There was a meeting earlier today just for the leaders of the working groups. So for people who signed up for the working groups, you'll um, get a message soon if you haven't already from those um, folks. And that will be developing materials to be used at virtual field camps or in field classes. Um, so that's one thing that's coming up. We'll have a meeting next. There's, okay, there'll be a workshop on this Saturday for people who are interested in um, developing the learning objectives and skills that are um, used, that are basically developed at field camp to make sure that when we do the virtual activities, we come up with them. That announcement was in my email. So if you have, if you are interested in that, um, Kurt Burmeister is the lead on that, but then there's a survey that um, you are asked to fill out that is on the email that was just attached. So let me know if you can't see that. And then um, we will keep going with our meetings on Monday um, for which we'll, and what we'll have next Monday is a report out from the last, um, from the workshop that's happening this Saturday on learning goals because all the working groups basically need to incorporate those um, learning objectives into their outcomes. All right, are there any questions about that or Anne, do you have any other further announcements you'd like to make? Nothing for me. Excellent. Okay, then I'm going to turn this over. We have three different presentations today. Um, Doug Walker is going to talk about Strabo Spot. Callan Bentley, who just joined us, will talk about Gigapans. And then Paul Carabinos will talk about SketchUp and um, his work on that. So we're going to go in that order. Um, Doug is going to take um, the 30 minutes of that because Strabo Spot's probably more complicated and we were a little more organized on that. So I'm gonna let Doug take it from here. All right, great. So can everybody see um, my screen okay? Yes, we can see it, Doug. All right, so I'm gonna describe and, and run through some stuff with Strabo Spot. Uh, Strabo Spot's a mobile app, it's also on the web. Uh, you can go to strabospot.org and uh, go to our website. That'll take you to links for Android or iOS downloads of the app. Uh, it'll run on both. Uh, at this point, we're working in the future probably for an iOS version only, but for now, it's uh, workable regardless of what you have, and you could work on things on um, a computer logged into the website too if you want. Uh, it has an editor and capabilities of doing basically everything that you can do on uh, the, uh, with the mobile app itself. So when you go in and you first install it, this is the opening page of it. Um, and you'll enter a username and password or create a username and password. It is uh, since you are collecting data and you are collecting your own information, you actually do create an account. And I'm not going to talk about today, but you can create class accounts if you want. You can share users. There's a lot of flexibility in that if you want to set it up that way. Um, that's all a, a fair bit more detailed, though, and, and uh, I don't want to really go into that at this point. I'd rather just stick with, with how it works and what capabilities are. Okay, so uh, when you, assuming you went in and logged in um, and got onto uh, Strabo Spot, you would come to a screen that looks like this. Uh, this is manage, uh, a management screen. Whenever you're working with Strabo Spot uh, and you're logged in, you can access a lot of different uh, projects if you have a lot of different projects or, or different resources. This is a main page that we come to. It's like a lot of apps uh, going from page to page is controlled here in the upper left by the three line or hamburger menu. And then actions on that page are controlled by the three dots. So um, three dot menu. So you can do a pr new project, switch projects, and that's all we'll worry about at this point. The other ones are gonna be useful uh, as we go down, but we'll have examples of these later as we go through. Uh, what I'm showing today is a project for uh, field camp that we had last summer. 
Uh, one thing about the field camps I wanted to, to say is that we actually have uh, five years worth of data now from our field camps, including well over 100 participants with all of their information data and all of their images and photos, et cetera. And these have all gone through uh, uh, clearance for anonymization, et cetera, to, to be used. So there are some data resources here we could use for projects. Anyway, so this is the main uh, management screen. Uh, and what I've done here is I've loaded up a particular project area called Blue Ridge, and that was for our field camp area. It's Blue Ridge, north of Canyon City, Colorado. Now I'm, I'm highlighting the main menu. So uh, you actually have the person who's logged in is attributed up there. Um, and then you're able to go through different parts of the data that you have as you add it. And the main data types here are the spots in Strabo spot. All your data are added to spots. All the information, photos, et cetera, are added to what we call spots. You can think of a spot as a station in your notebook. That's not 100% right, but, but it's close enough for our purposes here. And Basil, if, if I say anything wrong and you want to correct me, please jump in at any point. I will do so, Doug, and I'll answer the questions online so you don't need to worry about that. Oh, good, thank you. Um, attributes are things that are associated with your particular project uh, or data set, images or photographs, samples you take, relationships we're not gonna worry about today, and tags I'll talk about briefly. These are little sticky labels, but if you're making up or if you're putting in rock units, they go in as tags. So we'll see those in just a little bit. Uh, maps, you can have a main map, we'll get to that first. Image base maps uh, are basically, you can map on photographs you take. Uh, other base maps, you can bring in other uh, layers into the system and offline base maps are, are just um, things that you save to use if you're not in a connected environment. If we're talking about doing this in the lab or virtually, then you'll essentially always be connected. We're not going to worry about that too much. Manage, you saw description preferences. Won't worry too much about that or the things at the bottom. I'm mainly going to demo, uh, sorry, I'm mainly going to demo just kind of the basic functionality. So now what I'm going to do is go to the main map. And this is a, a geologic map for a study area in Colorado. Uh, basically, in Strabo, if you look at the right-hand side, sorry, the left-hand side, you have the three-line menu. Uh, can you guys see the pointer on my cursor as I'm going around or not? We can. It's quite small, though, Doug. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. I don't know if I have a better pointer or not, but the three-line menu here, this is uh, the plus and minuses are zooming in and zooming out. Uh, the balloon shape is the standard point spot shape. Uh, you can draw or add data as either points, lines, or polygons within Strabo spot. So that's what the point here uh, highlighted, line highlighted, or polygon tool do. And if we have time later, I'll talk about editing spots. Don't worry too much about that at this point. But the point is you can add data in forms that you would normally add information to a geologic map. The other thing you're uh, encouraged to do is you have this lower part here, the little uh, catalog looking page. That basically lists your data data sets, and online base maps. And online base maps, again, I'm not gonna go through this, but you can uh, use these uh, map box topo, which is what you're seeing here. Uh, there's a satellite layer uh, that you can get to. These are served worldwide. Uh, street maps and not showing much for out here in the country. And then there is a geology layer from Macrostrat go back to the topo, you can add any base map that you want. And uh, there are instructions if you go to um, uh, the Strabo Spot uh, website, you can find the help menu. There's an entire help manual 
for this that describes how to add other base maps and do a lot of different things connected with Strava Spot. Well, anyway, so this is an existing geologic map. I'm putting my finger on the screen and moving it around now. You can navigate around uh, as much as you want. I'll just show you some of the benefits. I think that, uh, and my students uh, bring up all the time for using Strabo Spot. I'm gonna add a spot here. Uh, I just put a point on the map. If you wanna look at it, it's this point right there. I can go back to it by touching it and see more it gets me back there. And right now I'm showing some tabs at the top here for the spot that tells you information about the spot orientations. Uh, you can add strikes and dips, trend and plunges, whatever you want. Uh, you can add 3D structures such as fabrics, folds, tensors, but mostly we'll use this for fabrics and folds. Images allows you to add pictures and tags allows you to add a lot of ancillary data that we'll see here in just a minute. Let me go back to the spot page. And you can see on here, you can set it to your location, don't worry about that. The name of the spot is there so you can navigate around. You can call it whatever you want. Uh, it has GPS information. And then you can see this thing called rock unit. We'll get to that later on. But again, going back to what students really like about this, suppose a student were taking a strike and dip here, they would add a plane, they get a dialog box. And don't worry too much about the top part of it. There's actually a built-in compass uh, to Strabo that you could use. You probably wouldn't want to use that if you're just online. But the real power comes in as we get down kind of to the middle of the screen with planar measurement quality. Uh, you can enter quality qualifiers. Uh, you can rank how good the quality of your measurement is. But the next thing that students really like is that it gives them a menu for selecting features, bedding, contacts, foliations. They always have other. Every, every one of these is going to have an other entry in case it's not in this list. But for example, if I enter contact, then all of a sudden I can get contact type. So there's a contextually sensitive guide for the students going through here. So it's a volcanic contact, uh, and then they can enter other things. For example, if the contact were uh, a fault, then they would get something to talk about the type of fault, reverse fault, and then movement indicators. And then for some of these, uh, you get a whole list of features that might be associated with that structure. So for fault planes, uh, this is just a list of commonly associated directional indicators. Um, and you can qualify other things. So again, this is, this is the features that we've added to fairly extensively for structural geology and field geology that allow you to, uh, if students are using it, they can get this whole potpourri of lists. Now I'm not gonna go through them all, it's kind of a, be a waste of time to do that. But uh, if you think of a typical thing that you would draw on a map, uh, you would have this context to be able to put on them. Images, uh, you can take pictures, you can see that up here, or add an image from a file. Uh, you can add all kinds of different image types. And so, for example, um, uh, you can add uh, photos, you can make sketches, cross section, stratigraphic section, we'll see one of those briefly at the end. Etc. So you can you can add a lot of different image types to support what you have, and then tags. I'll spend just a minute with this. One thing that we we do do with uh, we can do with tags is add data to something, and we can create a new tag. And a tag basically is a sticky note. And the way we often use this is uh, for unit labels, quartzite, select a type here. We would select geologic unit. And then we could add a whole lot of information again to this unit. Again, um, all of this becomes text, uh, uh, textual with the types that you add. So if I add sedimentary rock, then I would get a list of sedimentary rock types. 
that I could add to this, et cetera. If I go into geologic ages, you can use this to help students learn geologic ages. You go to Phanerozoic, Mesozoic, and then Jurassic. You actually then get uh, a list of ages for it. So there's a lot of context that you could put in here. And uh, if you give an abbreviation uh, QT, then I'm able to use that QT, ZT, label and apply it to spot. So for example, if I go back to the spot level now and I'm adding geologic units, I can add this QT tag to something if I wanted to. All right. So that gets us through a lot of kind of the basics there. I can do the same thing with lines. Draw a line on the map. Uh, you can make a line into a trace feature, and then all of a sudden your contacts come to life. So you could have uh, known, approximate, your usual thing with contacts, your contact type. So for example, a geologic structure could be a fault, and I can enter more information on that. And then if I go back to the map, you can see that that line will draw in depending upon how I qualify it. So I have here uh, NT180, I can see more. I have it as, uh, I need to set the quality, for example, to known. Once I do that and go back to the map, it's a solid line. The symbology is not changeable. So we basically have a very set symbology that goes with this. Uh, you can change colors of polygons, for example, but a lot of the symbology is set. It's not intended to be a GIS, it's intended to be used in the field with mapping and show you the kinds of data that you have. So those are just a couple examples of drawing new things and exploring through it. Uh, we have other options associated with it that are kind of nice. So this is a project area where uh, we had this uh, point right here where you can see it looks like there's a whole mess of strikes and dips all together. And the reason is, is when I go to that point, sorry, let me go back to the main map. If I go to this point, then if I go into orientations, you can see I have a lot of different orientations entered here. So for example, uh, this particular point, this outcrop, I'm going to show the image of this. And then again, I have lots and lots of points with lots of images. Uh, this is an area of some tight folding that we're able to measure lots of foliations and lineations on. Um, I'm able to take that and then put a lot of data on it. And so I had that one point back here. Uh, I could, if I wanted to, at this juncture, uh, take orientation data and put it into stereo net. I won't demonstrate all of this, but if you go to Rick Allmendinger stereo net mobile, you could actually go to a map like this, draw a loop around a set of spots and it would copy them to the clipboard in a way that will go straight into stereo net. So one of the things we did in this area, which has a bunch of folding in it, is the students as they're working in the field can grab foliation measurements compositional layering measurements and plot those up to see if they can determine anything with structural orientation or, or fold um, shape or fold analysis. So there's a lot of, of things built into Strabo Spot that allow you to do a fair amount of detail. Um, and that's an important point. I, I can't demo everything here. If you get the help manual, you can look through it. Uh, you can just play with it and see what, what is available there. Now, I had that picture that I showed you. Suppose that I wanted to do detailed work on that picture. Well, it turns out we turn those into something we call image-based maps. And an image-based map is a type of presentation of the image where you get the photo and then you could add data to it. So if I wanted to, I could actually add a point right here where I could document a strike and dip or I could add, I'm not gonna do this very well here, 
I could add a contact onto the photo, for example, if I wanted to. And then I would be able to put that in as a trace feature. I'd be able to document that if I wanted to. So there's a lot of, of things I could do on individual photos. So yeah, with your students, you are able to go ahead and, and add this material, add a, a lot of information to it. If you mess up a line, uh, for example, I can go in and I can edit a line feature and take points out of it. That was pretty quick there, but I could grab a line and move it around uh, with the editing uh, capabilities if I wanted to, or not save them if I don't want to. Doug, can you anyway, also, yeah. Doug, can you show how to move a spot? Ah, so then what I would do is go to the edit mode. I just put my finger on the spot to select it, and then I can move it around to wherever I want to place it. And that works. I can do that on the main map as well. If I go to the main map, I can do that there as well. You can't see my finger on the screen, but that's that's all I'm using to move this around. Okay, so that that gives us uh, kind of a tour, quick tour of the, the mapping capabilities. I just want to spend a couple minutes exploring something else, which is the strat section capabilities. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to load up, I'm going to switch projects here. Actually, let me spend just a moment here while I'm at it. Um, switch products, projects is what I'm going to do. Upload and download uh, that you see here, go to the main server, and then export and import project from device are ways that you can share projects between people. So for example, if you had a project, if you went through and put together a very detailed Strabo project, you could through iTunes uh, place that onto a bunch of devices or in Android, you could just copy it from a server. And then that project with all its data and images could be directly imported. So it's build it once, use it many times with that. What I'm going to do here, though, is I'm going to switch projects to this one called SEDS. And then I'm going to make it active. Uh, it has 30 spots and no images. And now, if I go to, I have to actually turn on testing mode. This will change a little bit. But in testing mode, I'm able to see strat sections. And so, for example, this project contains a strat section for the San Rafael swell. And what I can do in here is you can see the inner beds, you can see different intervals on here. And the sort of leading people through observations can be done here just as well. So if I click on here, I can go through it and enter a lot of information. And I can do all kinds of different things, again, for sedimentary lithologies, I can classify basics like thicknesses and types, textures, composition would be what kind of rock it is, what kind of minerals are in it. For example, uh, sedimentary structures, I would be able to go to and look at physical, biogenic, chemogenic, pedogenic, and sedimentary interpretations, again, putting in environments and, and surfaces. Etc. So there's a lot of a, a lot of flexibility in here uh, that you can have, but at the same time, it has a lot of vocabulary built into it, and you're able to add and build stratigraphic sections if you want. But again, it will help lead the students through the observations that they're making, and that's something that we find quite invaluable with beginning students as we're teaching them how to to just make field observations, period. Um, so that's 25 minutes. I wanted to end to leave some time for questions. So I think I'm going to end right there if it's OK with you, Basil. And uh, that gives you a, a good idea of what's available in here. Again, um, it takes a while to get going with this. Uh, it will take probably you as more time than students. Uh, we generally uh, expose students to this for an hour or two going into the field. Uh, it was designed and works just uh, same kind of navigation as normal. 
uh, apps do, mobile apps. So uh, students we find generally work their way through this in no time. I mean, by the end of the first morning, they're fairly fluent in, in using things. Uh, there's, okay. some there's some questions online. So for instance, when you want to turn in a final map for a student that had like a title or a scale, how do you do that at the Kansas Field Camp? We just do it by a screen capture. And in fact, uh, our final reports that students put in there are completely done on the, the tablet. So they type their report in, uh, in uh, a writing document, they save screen captures, they paste those in, and they submit a PDF. Um, I haven't gone through all of these capabilities, but for student projects, when they save and upload their project to the server, you can actually print their project out as a complete PDF and you can see every observation, every picture, everything that they did with the project. Again, that's a lot of different stuff there, but um, uh, that I don't really have time to go through, but there's a lot of capabilities in that. We, we use this extensively in our field camp. Last summer, we four of the six weeks of teaching field camp were done with this uh, app. Doug, there's some questions about how to export it and if you could be exported to Illustrator and so it forth. Can be illust it can be exported as PDF, as SVG. So for example, this uh, diagram right here would export as SVG that you could then bring into Open in Illustrator or other vector graphic programs. And you can also export at the end of the day, like a field camp, just like a, a field book, correct? Yeah, you can export a field book that would show your day's work. You Pretty much you can export any of the screens and any of the data that I showed you before, you can export that and in some format. You can actually also export to shape files or import shape files. So if you're connecting, uh, like we used to do, connect our field camp pretty extensively with GIS, uh, you have that capability as well. So Doug, there was a question about a final product, if you could show a final map product. I don't know if you have had that accessible. I would have to go from, I didn't have that accessible. I could go from screen to screen. I, I'm sure I have some downloaded, but uh, I would have to search for a minute. I don't really want to spend the time, but what the, the final project, what their final product would look like would be, for example, it would look like that strat section, or it would, if I go back to manage here, I'll go back to my field camp project, um, one of their final products, for example, could be this particular geologic map uh, that they brought into a drawing program or a vector program that then they then put a legend on and a name and title and things like that. So they can, they can do things with this. So what I got last year at this field camp would be uh, two or three versions of this map uh, that they portrayed in different ways and emphasized different parts of, and a written description of the geology. And that came in as a complete single PDF package. And it, it was, the students just did it. Um, uh, it was pretty easy for them to do, just informing them, hey, this is what we want at the end. They all, it was fairly natural for them to do. Okay, great. I think in the interest of time, let's go ahead over and switch to Callens. Um, Doug, I'm gonna ask, suggest that you read, there's some really good comments that okay. came up that you can think about doing. Okay, save, save the chat, but I'm gonna get the next one ready, I hope. So, um, hi everybody, this is Callen Bentley uh, from Northern Virginia Community College and um, I'm on rural Wi-Fi, and so uh, Doug was good enough to broadcast my presentation as a video. So that's what I'll be playing in the background here. Um, my audience, I teach at a community college, so my audience is a little different from the field camp audience. Um, some of the stuff I'll be showing today is fairly basic geology, um, but uh, I hope that uh, the demonstrations of the different media types will inspire you to uh, think about potential inclusions that you might utilize in your, your work in field camps. So Doug, if you wanna play that video, um, okay. go for it. It started. 
All right, awesome. So um, I want to talk to you about gigapixel panoramas and related topics, virtual field experiences. Um, gigapans uh, are robots that hold cameras that take a series of overlapping photographs. These photographs get stitched together to make a big image and then students can explore that image and get insights. So we've built a series of virtual field experiences around these uh, media. And um, I'll go ahead and place some links into the chat so you can explore these on your own. The one that's on the screen right now is a virtual field experience for Sicker Point, the famous angular unconformity in Scotland. And you can see that I've built this in a web page. Um, so this looks basically like a blog post. In fact, that's the original genesis of this particular virtual field experience with a lot of embedded photographs and some text. So I'm uh, treating this one as kind of a guided tour where I'm taking people around and showing them relevant aspects of the geology of this particular site. And then within that same web page, you can also embed these gigapan images. So it looks like a normal photo at first, but the user can choose to dive in and explore. And um, you know, when they make observations, that generates new hypotheses in their head, and then they can explore other parts of the image to test those hypotheses. So um, I've made a lot of these over the years. Um, some of them, uh, like you see here, are at the outcrop and landscape scale, and um, some are at smaller scales, as I'll demonstrate in a minute. Another medium that we use is the 360-degree uh, spherical photo. So these are made using a little device called a Theta 360 that takes the picture instantaneously. And you can zoom in on details, like here, some of the conglomerate at the base of the overlying unit at Sicker Point. And then the third and final um, sort of, uh, or I guess fourth, if you count regular photos, our fourth and final kind of medium is the 3D model. These are built using photogrammetry and we host them on Sketchfab. And just like the Gigapans, they can be embedded in a web page as an element in one of these virtual field experiences. So here's the uh, unconformity at Sicker Point as a 3D model, which I think is really powerful because it allows users to get a sense of how it looks different from different perspectives, which is one of the key advantages of actually being in the field in the first place. So um, that's an example of that. We also have a tool called a Giga Macro, and this um, is like a Gigapan, but it makes big pictures of very small things. So to demonstrate this, here's a virtual field experience to Wind River Canyon in Wyoming, where we have hand samples of rocks, and the students are challenged to figure it out on their own, and they get to explore these hand samples. So this is a, a sandstone, it's the uh, flathead sandstone there, the equivalent of the Tapetes and many other you know, Cambrian sandstones around the country. And uh, there are also uh, two other rock units at the site. There's a granite. So here we've got some nice graphic texture in this uh, granite. And here's some of the ferromagnesium minerals along with the case bar and the quartz. And then there's a Archean schist there as well. And so that's the last of these three samples that the students explore. And so here I'm challenging my students to identify the rock. So to, to figure out what sorts of rocks they're dealing with, are these igneous metamorphic or sedimentary? And then we have outcrop images that can put those different rocks into historical context where we're asking them to figure out how these different units relate to one another. So here, for instance, you can see the granite cutting across the schist. And then there is a profound unconformity. You might even call it a great unconformity. And then above that is the uh, sandstone. And so once they've established those relationships, I have them go through some calculations, isotopes and, and uh, index fossils to figure out how old the units are. Here is another example. This is a virtual field experience I designed for a physical geology course on glaciers. So uh, the students here are exploring various glaciers around the world. Um, you can embed these side by side for comparison. So this is looking at a stream carved valley versus a glaciated valley. So students can look at their different shapes and match them up sort of left to right. Um, you'll notice here that I'm using a slightly different embedding code. You can see the word giga macro there, even though these aren't small objects. And the reason for that is the giga macro viewer has a bunch of capabilities that the regular giga pan viewer doesn't. So for instance, here's a, a polyline annotation where I can circle a feature or you know, trace it out and then ask uh, specific questions about that particular feature. 
So here's another example of that where I trace it out and then uh, ask a question. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, same idea here, uh, a couple of lateral moraines and uh, a hanging valley. So this is uh, useful functionality that doesn't exist in the regular gigapan.com website. The other thing that's really great about this viewer is it has a dynamic scale. So if you watch the scale bar in the lower right here as I zoom in on some of these glacial striations, uh, you'll see that it changes dynamically with the level of zoom. And so that makes it easier for students to keep track of how big the stuff is that they're looking at. Um, that's uh, something that the regular gigapan.com website can't do. And here's a comparison of looking at two samples of, of sedimentary rock, uh, a sort of glacial diamictite on the left and a, a set of con sedimentary conglomerate on the right. Um, lastly, I want to point out that other media can be uh, displayed in the same format. So here's some USGS topographic maps. And down here at the bottom, I've got uh, colorized LIDAR from uh, Finland. And we can zoom in here and see various landforms like this beautiful esker. Or if we zoom out and uh, look at a spot where one of those eskers pierces through the prominent uh, lateral moraine there, or I'm sorry, uh, terminal moraine, you see a nice outwash delta. Now, um, Doug, I think this is the point that I'm, my movie cuts out. So I'm gonna have to uh, now take over the screen sharing um, and uh, show my own screen here. Okay, so, I'm gonna stop share and you should be Yep, I'm, I'm on it. So I, I should be broadcasting now. Um, so this is looking at a, uh, an exercise using index fossils to figure out how old different sedimentary packages are. So this has two parts, an initial part where the students learn the different fossils by exploring giga macros. Uh, so that was a graptolite there, and you can see there's a bunch of others. Um, and they get to kind of you know, make notes and figure out uh, what these things look like so they can identify them when they see them again in the, the geologic context. Um, the other nice thing about the giga macro viewer is you can start it off at any level of zoom you choose when you embed it, um, you don't have to pick the all the way zoomed out version. And you can also rotate the images. If you're not happy with the uh, original orientation, you can put them into an orientation that you like and it will embed um, durably at that new level. So once the students have learned the fossils in this uh, portion of the uh, virtual field experience, they click on a link and go to this hypothetical region. It's very complex, check it out. All right, so a, a sort of classic cartoon cross section here. And then the different units there have fossils associated with them. So we'll just show unit D here. Unit D is, um, uh, consists of uh, sediments that contain three different fossils. We've got a nice straight nautiloid here that hopefully they'll be able to identify. This is not the same nice straight nautiloid that they uh, learned from in the previous page. It's a new example of the same organism, a new example of the same phenomenon. And um, yeah, and so then they, they get to figure things out uh, on the basis of the ages that are associated with these different fossils. So for instance, here, these are Devonian age rocks on the basis of the, uh, the nautiloid, which is not all that useful, and then Mucrospirifer fossils, which are actually uh, useful. So um, that's uh, that experience. And now let me show you one other thing here. I'm going to stop my share and just go to a different screen. So I'm going to share again. And let me go to this screen. You're now looking at a live view of the uh, Giga Macro uh, viewers sort of homepage. And I just wanted to show you guys how this uh, works. So we have, for instance, a whole bunch of different gigapans of sediment samples from around the world. Here's an example of one of those. This is a Petri dish full of sand from St. Ninian's Isle in, in uh, Shetland. And if you decide that that's you know, an element that you wanna use in one of your virtual field experiences that you're building for your students in the summer, you can capture the, um, the number, the Gigapan number off the Gigapan page. And then if you go to the Giga Macro page, you simply need to add image and all you have to do is, is dump that number in. And this looks like it's not gonna work because of my rural internet. So at any rate, it's real simple to do and um, uh, quite easy. So um, 
Doug, can we go back now to your sharing of my video and jump ahead to eight and a half minutes in? Doug, you're on mute if that matters. Um, I'm not sure we can do that at this moment. Okay, so hang on one sec then. I can, um, I can make this happen. So I'm just gonna reshare my screen then and I'll go to this. Okay, and then I'll just jump ahead to where it stopped cutting out. So the last thing I wanted to show you guys was Streetcar to Subduction. This is built using new content creation tools where myself and a few other colleagues um, reimagine Clyde Warhaftig's classic field guide to the geology of San Francisco uh, using new Google Earth content creation tools. And these are with the browser-based Google Earth, not the standard desktop one that we're all familiar with. But this allows you to build tours that allow you to direct people to go through a given area. These work on site if you have a mobile phone and the Google Earth app, or you can use them as remote virtual field experiences like I'm demonstrating here. So there's logistical information about where to park and uh, how to identify poison oak so you don't end up in the hospital. And then you can jump around to some of the different geologic sites. So this is Google Earth, which means you can grab the screen at any point and swivel it around to whatever orientation you want. This basically just takes people on a sort of linear series of stops through that Google Earth uh, experience. And so you can add in imagery on the side and short descriptions. The descriptions can have links that go out to other resources. Um, you can make polygons on the landscape or you can make uh, polylines or you can just make single points. And the other thing that we uh, have the ability to do here is put in videos. So um, Google of course now owns YouTube. So YouTube videos embed really nicely into this experience. Um, and so here's an example of one of those videos where we have John Wakabayashi from uh, Cal State Fresno explaining about the geology of one of uh, the sites in Streetcar to Seduction called Ring Mountain. Um, and I don't have the sound playing here, but um, you know, they, they are fully equipped with sound and the videos were produced by AGU with um, pretty high quality annotations and um, uh, video production capabilities. So um, this is you know, another potential tool in the toolbox as you all are contemplating how to uh, deliver field camp-like experiences uh, in short order this coming summer. Um, so I'll go ahead and cut myself off there. If there are any questions, I'd be delighted to answer them. So Callan, thank you very much for doing that. You gave us some of the links in the chat. Um, and if it's okay, we'll, um, I'll ask you to put those on the uh, NAGT site as well. So the sure. people have access to them there. Um, there's a question about how you're putting in the YouTube videos and are the gimmick gigapan images free or how do you do them? Okay, so real quick, when you're building stuff in the, the new uh, browser-based Google Earth content creation tools, it's uh, quite straightforward. Um, when you go to add material, you can choose material that has a, a, a home on the web already. You just copy the URL, or if you have it in your Google Drive, you can dump it in there. Or if it's a YouTube video, you just paste in the URL. So it's super easy. Um, the Gigapan images are free. And um, my group has been supported by the National Science Foundation to develop these things. And so we are really keen to see people use them. We've made thousands of them at all scales. Um, unfortunately, the gigapan.com website is not really um, a great website. And so the easiest way to find those images is to do a, a traditional Google search where you search for like cross bedding sandstone gigapan and then uh, stuff will pop up. I'd also point out that if you're having difficulty finding images, I know where they all are. And um, uh, I'm not teaching field camp this summer, so I have some time that I can devote to helping you guys sort this out. Just reach out and ask. Okay, so Callan, um, can you stop sharing your screen? We're gonna get Paul Carabinos to share his screen. If somebody has another question for Callan as he's doing that. Um, I am not sharing at the moment. Okay, Paul, do you wanna start sharing your screen? Yes. Excellent. Okay. 
Can you see uh, this If you have screen? questions for Talon, go ahead and put them in the chat box. And otherwise, Paul, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Okay, I, I, I feel compelled to, to, to mention at the start that um, Basil asked me to do this about an hour ago. So I'm not super organized. Guilty as charged. And um, so, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about SketchUp and some geologic maps that I've been making to, to really integrate with this fantastic tool that Rick Allmendinger has created called Geologic Map Data Extractor. But I, let me just start off um, explaining how this got started. So I was really interested in showing students how geologic maps and cross sections relate to one another. So, and I was looking for a way to do that and I, I, there were a lot of false starts, but then I figured out a way of doing it with SketchUp. So can everyone, can you guys see this, this um, DEM with we the can, geologic we, map on it? Yes, and well, your cursor is very obvious. Okay. And so you can, so in SketchUp, this is a DEM and I've draped over it the geologic map um, of the Castle Reef Quadrangle in uh, Montana. <clears throat> and then the idea, the, the dream was that people could see like what a cross section looks like with the, the geologic map. And so uh, let me just say, if, if people have geologic maps that they really want to use for, for teaching purposes, um, it works best for maps at a seven and a half minute quadrangle scale. Um, and if, so if there are published maps and cross sections and you know the, the, the datum and all of that, um, the, basically the coordinate system of the map, um, it's, it's easy to make these and I can, I can explain to people how to do it. I have a little tutorial out there um, if it came to it, I could, I could do it myself. So, so this, was, this was kind of a starting point and got me excited about SketchUp and I've done a, different, a number of different projects with SketchUp. But then Rick Allmendinger came up with um, this great um, tool called Geologic Map Data Extractor. And so what I did was, um, started using this, the, the white thing over here is a DEM. This is actually from close to where I live. So just a little stream valley. And um, I can turn that DEM on and off with the layer tool. And so I take this and I come up with some cross section. And then, um, so I, 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 I make a little plane over here and drew in some folds and then the layers are truncated by an unconformity. And then you can grab something like this layer and pull it through the DEM. And when you do that, it intersects the DEM surface. And um, so I'm gonna try to get that all the way through. So you can, it, it intersects the DEM surface and then if you do that with each of the different layers um, and you do a little intersection, you can create this geologic map. So this, unlike any kind of published geologic map, this is geometrically essentially perfect. And um, so you can do that. So SketchUp is very limited in terms of the drafting abilities. So what I do is I export all the different layers, like I make contacts, um, I make 20 meter contours and 100 meter contours. And then I um, export all of the, these things as different file types. I bring them into Adobe Illustrator where you can actually make a much nicer map. And then this is what that map looks like. And I've, this is, um, now it just brought down into geologic. So, so this is Rick Allmendinger's program, um, geologic map data extractor. And so there's actually DEM information embedded in this program. So I, I made this map using a DEM. And so I've carried that information. And if you look at this bottom part of the screen here, um, the, this is the latitude and longitude. And then these are just basically pixel coordinates. So as I move the cursor, um, 
that information can be seen. And then I can um, go to the, uh, add the, so now when I add that um, <clears throat> DEM, I also have this third number that's just the elevation. So I'm on the 600 meter contour. And um, so if everything is registered properly, like you've done a good job lining up the DEM with your map, then the agreement between the contours and the elevation you see down on the lower left of the screen should be pretty good. So now this is, Rick is undeniably a genius. And so there, there are different things that you can do. The reason I made um, these maps to integrate with his program was really um, to introduce students how to use this program. Um, if, if you give them an actual geologic map that has interpretations and errors and um, maybe a more complicated DEM and stuff, um, they might get funny results and they might wonder if it's because of the geologic uncertainty or if it's because they're doing something wrong. So in this case, with these simple maps, I have a few of them made already. Um, it's like, it's basically nothing can go wrong as long as they're doing stuff correctly. So this is one thing. Um, Rick has created this three-point problem. So you, this is uh, a, a simple thing that you can do. You click here, you find a contact here between units B and C, and click on one point. You click on a second point and you see the, ele the, the east and north and then the um, elevation. And then you click on the third point and if everything has gone well, then you get a strike and dip. So you have a strike and dip and it actually shows the strike and dip orientation. And then um, uh, Rick has also set this up so that you can click on a fourth point, just one point on another surface. So I'm gonna do the AB contact and it's gonna give me the thickness of unit B, which is about uh, 79 meters. So um, it's, it's a very, very simple, like what I'm showing you is very simple. The Rick's program does a tremendous number of different things. You could click on many points along this contact and then get a best fit strike and dip. You could um, actually trace out an entire contact and, and then um, you can get topographic profiles and actually create cross sections using this. So if you were interested in having students use this for a real geologic map, um, then these sorts of maps that I've made, which are just sort of I'm happy to make freely available. I only have four so far, but I'm planning on making more um, when I get the time. Then uh, these are great uh, ways for introducing students to this program. Um, they're also just, you know, in terms of uh, one of my goals was to make a new set of maps that could be used as standalone paper map exercises uh, to replace some of those classic old things that that the British were so good at creating um, that, and, and have kind of are hard to find now. So that's, that's kind of what I've got to say, Basil. That was awesome. Thank you, Paul. It's eye candy as far as I'm concerned, but it's also, I'm sure has a lot of pedagogical value if we can figure out how to use it effectively. Are there any SketchUp questions? is a lot of fun. And it's and, and, and SketchUp, which is now owned by Trimble, Google sold it to Trimble. There's SketchUp Pro and it's free to um, educators, uh, not to students. And um, they have, there used to be a free version of SketchUp and now that has disappeared. And there's like a web version, which I don't find as useful. But if you wanna make stuff with SketchUp, you, it's, you, basically you just request a free, educator's license. And um, Paul, uh, there are some requests to share the maps you've made and so forth. Um, could you 
do that or do is there an easy place for you to go to get them at this point um i i i was going to talk to you about the easiest way to do that so the let me just go back to this file um if i can find this there are a couple so you need more than just the map um you need for instance you would get the, the map, you would need the DEM information, and then there's a little text file that's super simple, that uh, the way that Rick set this up, that just contains the basically the four coordinates on the uh, corners of the map. So if you have all of that stuff in the same folder, it works really, really well. And um, so, yes, I should talk to you, Basil, about, um, uh creating some like maybe on the nagt website a way of like just making it super accessible to everyone that'd be great we'll have that conversation we will certainly need ann on the line for that too yeah. um uh, in the meantime are there other questions for um paul while he's steel hill or or callan or doug I'll just throw in that uh, for the GigaPan, uh, Alan Glazner put together a, a kind of an index that I put up online. It's done through the Strava Spot website, uh, but that is another access point into GigaPan, and those are unbelievable images. Thanks. <laughs>